In a previous video, I explained how you have to tell a story in a way that makes it interesting to all of your audience. Uh, and I explained that two of the ways of doing this were through introducing an element of surprise and human interest. So, for example, if your story is about a Super Bowl final, how do you make it interesting to people who don't like the NFL. Now the link to that video is on the screen now. If you haven't watched it, I suggest you do so before you watch the rest of this video because in this one I'm going to give you a story that illustrates both surprise and also human interest. Um, you could use this story in any presentation to do with attention to detail. For example, let's say that you have um, a major a new product launch coming up and all of your account managers are preparing their presentations to take out to see their major customers and you want to make sure that everything has been prepared properly that all the bases have been covered all the T's are crossed all the I's are dotted that no silly mistakes have been made now if you're going to use this to open up a presentation don't preface it with anything else no greeting no self introduction no it's good to see you you get on your feet and go straight into the story and the first words out of your mouth should be the first line of the story which is it's 1805 and General Karl Mack Freiherr von Leiberich, the commander of the Austrian army, well to say he's excited would be an understatement. He's been longing for the day that's about to unfold for years. Russia, Austria and Great Britain have just formed the third coalition against Napoleonic France. And the strategy to which Mack has been a considerable contributor is for Britain to continue to uh, fight France at sea while Russia and Austria do it on land. Well, so far, same old, same old, same as Norway. But what's different this time, what's new, what's almost revolutionary, is that for the first time ever, the Austrian and Russian armies are going to fight together, side by side, under a single commander. Now, the plan is for the two armies to rendezvous in southern Germany and then to move south through the Alps to invade northern Italy, which Austria had lost to France about 10 years earlier. Now, Mack has a personal stake in this because he was responsible for that loss and spent two years as a prisoner of war in Paris, despite having been promised his freedom. He thirsts for personal revenge. I mean, he wants it so badly, he can almost taste it. Now, Napoleon is up on the uh, coast of the English Channel, uh, preparing to invade Britain with his entire army, 400,000 men. But when he finds out what's happening, he'll have to leave those men behind, race the whole length of France to Italy to deal with the threat. Now, he only has about 70,000 men in Italy, but the Russians and the Austrians together will have about 145,000, giving them a superiority of two to one. Not even Napoleon can fight odds of two to one. I mean, no wonder Mac is excited by this. This plan, it's looking pretty foolproof. It can't fail. It's October the 20th, the date for the proposed rendezvous, and Mac is awaiting the arrival of the Russians. His scouts come to him with the first reports that riders have been seen approaching for the east. This is it, he thinks. He can almost smell victory. This is the day he's been waiting for, for so long. He starts to think about the campaign and what they're about to do. He's going to take Napoleon, this Corsican peasant, this over-promoted corporal, this jumped-up little upstart, who thinks that just because he's managed to browbeat the French Senate into giving him the title of Emperor, that he's the actual equal of real royalty, such as Emperor Francis and Tsar Nicholas. He's not just going to defeat him. He's going to humiliate him. He's going to crush him maybe even take him back to Vienna in chains. He starts to think about the rewards that will be his. I mean, money, land, decorations, they're all a given. But maybe a dukedom isn't even completely out of the question if this goes right. As one of the men who defeated Napoleon, he'll be lionized across Europe in polite society. He'll be cheered to the rafters every time he shows his face in the streets. But most importantly of all, he'll earn the undying thanks and gratitude of his beloved Emperor Francis. Then his scouts return with the equivalent of a 19th century good news, bad news joke. The good news is that thousands of riders are now approaching from the east. 
The bad news is that they're not Russian. They're French. Well, at first, Mac doesn't believe it. It's impossible. It can't be. Napoleon is halfway down France at the moment, heading for Italy. But when his scouts insist that the troops they've seen are French, he starts to think about this, and he thinks this could even be better than the original plan. To have arrived so far so fast, Napoleon can't have many men with him. It must just be a skeleton force. And the fool has placed himself unwittingly between Mac and the approaching Russians. When the Russians arrive, which surely they must do any hour now, they'll be able to catch him between the two armies and crush him like a grape. He can't believe Napoleon has been so foolish. He's walked into a trap of his own making. But as the day goes by, two things become apparent. The first is that Napoleon has done the impossible. He hasn't just arrived with a skeleton force, he's arrived with 200,000 men and has raced across northern Europe at breakneck speed to get there in time. And not only is he between Mac and the Russians, but he has Mac completely surrounded. The second thing is that the Russians are nowhere to be seen and they aren't going to arrive. Mac is alone and heavily outnumbered. In an incredible and almost comical display of ineptitude, no nobody on the Russian or Austrian general staffs appears to have realized that the two countries used different calendars. Now, the Austrians used the Gregorian calendar, which had been introduced the previous century, but the Russians still used the old Julian one. And in 1805, the difference between the two was 12 days. So while both armies intended to arrive on October the 20th, the Russians won't actually turn up until November the 1st. After only a few brief skirmishes, Napoleon manages to force Mack to surrender and he takes 60,000 Austrians prisoner. As he capitulates and hands his sword to Napoleon, Mack describes himself or introduces himself as the unfortunate General Mack. And Napoleon smiles and says, I return to the unfortunate general both his sword and his freedom and my regards to give to the emperor. Well, good luck with that, because Emperor Francis is less magnanimous than Napoleon. When Mac returns to Vienna, his reception is less than warm. Instead of earning the undying gratitude and thanks of his emperor, he is court-martialed and stripped of his rank. Instead of being lionized across Europe, he becomes a laughingstock, as shown by these political cartoons of the time. Instead of being cheered to the rafters in the streets every time he shows his face, he doesn't even get the chance to go on the streets because he is imprisoned and spends two years behind bars. Sometimes it's all in the details. The grandest of plans can be brought low by the smallest of things. A tiny piece of trivia easily overlooked can mean the difference between glorious victory and disastrous defeat, between winning and losing, between success and failure. And I want you to remember this and this story as you're putting together your presentations to take out to see your major customers. Now the whole story about the unfortunate General Mack and the mix up over the calendars is a perfect way to talk about the importance of attention to detail. But rather than just talk about some maneuverings that happened during the Napoleonic War, by introducing a surprise, telling the story in a way that leads the audience in this direction, where outcome A, the defeat of Napoleon, seems inevitable, only for the story to switch and suddenly go in a completely different direction, and also to tell the story from the viewpoint of an individual, makes it far more interesting to far more people because now instead of a story about military history it's a story about human nature about ambition about pride about foolishness about hubris and who doesn't like stories about that